The Jam Handy Organization of Detroit was established by Henry Jamison Handy in 1924 as the nation's first motion picture company devoted to educational and industrial films. The Jam Handy Organization was an industry leader for 40 years based on the concept of teaching and selling through showmanship. Mr. Handy came from a family of journalists associated with the Chicago Tribune. He attended the University of Michigan and was a two-time Olympic swimmer in 1904 and 1924. He was also a coach for other Olympians such as Buster Crabb and Johnny Weismuller, who both went on to celebrated Hollywood careers. Handy's achievements led him to positions in business, and because of this, animation pioneer John R. Bray hired him as Vice President of Industrial Films for the Bray Studio due to the value of his name. Right away, Handy acquired many lucrative automobile accounts during the formation of General Motors. Then in 1921, the Bray Studio was sued by Goldwyn Pictures due to its failure to deliver its contracted films. Handy was let go, so he took his clients with him and started his own company, the Jam Handy Picture Service on East Grand Boulevard in Detroit. The Jam Handy organization employed 500 people and produced countless films for fairs, conventions, and theatrical exhibition. It had its own animation department, headed by Rockwell Rocky Barnes and stop-motion animator Frank Goldman, who invented the three-hole animation registration system. As the animation department expanded, Mr. Handy proudly declared how he had obtained the licenses for cell production from his former employer, John Bray. Gasoline. Liquid power to run millions of automobiles everywhere. Yet, how many know what happens to the gas after it is poured into the gas tanks? Or realize the care that motor car engineers have taken to give each drop an equal chance to do its duty. Gasoline is powerful, but each drop can give a 100% account of himself only when he finds the most efficiently designed gasoline system to help him along his journey. For a successful life, Every drop of gasoline depends entirely upon what happens to him after he gets in the swim. Ah, oh, a nice one. Let's go after that drop of gasoline. So this is what the inside of the gas tank looks like. Right. We'll have to dive too. Here goes. No, this isn't the water main. It's the gas line from the tank to the engine. It's a good thing it's cool in this gas line. If it ever got warm, the gasoline would form vapor and the pressure would hold the gas back in the tank. But we won't get stuck because this pipe is on the right side of the car while the hot exhaust is far over on the other side. This is the gasoline pump that's been pulling the gasoline along all this time. Well, here we are in the little glass bowl below the gasoline pump. It's made out of glass, so the owner can easily see any sediment collecting on the bottom and have it removed whenever necessary. We can't stop long here. 
guess the only place we can get out is through that screen up there. And is that going to be tough? The holes are certainly small. 14,000 of these tiny holes to the square inch keep dirt from reaching the carburetor. Even water can't get through this screen. Whoa, he seems to be stuck. Must be a bit of dirt clinging to him. But as soon as it comes off, he'll get through all right. There, he made it. The pump is a trusty friend of the gasoline. Always supplies just the right amount. Whenever the car is going uphill or makes a sudden burst of speed, the pump automatically works harder. But we've got to keep moving on to the carburetor. just came through the needle valve that lets the gasoline into the carburetor. That is the float on top of the gasoline. It controls the needle valve, keeping just the right amount of gas here in the bowl of the carburetor. Hey, there goes our drop again. He's going down through the metering jet at the bottom, but he's still in the carburetor. How's that for wind? It roars through the carburetor, sometimes at a speed as high as 800 miles an hour to vaporize the gasoline. That funnel above, and the other one below are called Venturi tubes. They control the speed and direction of this hurricane of air. Three tubes in this carburetor keep raw gasoline from getting into the engine. An important reason why the six cylinders of this engine run on a very small amount of gasoline. But look, there's our drop over there again. Say, he's getting bigger. He's being mixed with air. He'll grow up to be about 17 times his original size, so he can do his best when he gets into the cylinder. Right down to the manifold that distributes the gasoline to the cylinder. Ouch! We're standing on the hot spot. All the drops mixed with enough air are floating right on past. The others stop here to be vaporized. This manifold heater cuts down waste and lets each drop of gasoline do its best. Here we go down the manifold. Gasoline is whirled through the manifold to keep the mixture uniform, speeded up in one place and slowed down in another. So the same amount of gas gets into each one of the cylinders. These are the valves that control the gas going into the cylinders. These big intake valves certainly make it easy for gas to get into the cylinder. No crowding, no pushing, no waste. Important for gasoline economy. There's the spark plug up there, just in the right place to burn all this gasoline. And here comes that great big piston. There's the exhaust valve opening up. And here comes the piston again. Lucky they made the exhaust valve large too, so we can get out in a hurry. There goes the ghost of our drop of gasoline. Thanks to the engineers, he's given a perfect account of himself. He has led a more fortunate life than lots of other drops. Of course, every drop must go from the tank to the exhaust, but they don't all have the economy adventures met by every drop of gas which goes down this gasoline trail. It was said that the popular Nicky Nome theatricals made for Chevrolet saved it from bankruptcy. Now, here's a theme that never grows cold. 
always dear to young and old, the sweetest story ever told, a coach for Cinderella. You've heard about that huzzy Mrs. Webb Spider. No, but I'm listening. Well, far be it for me to gossip, but it seems that only last night, Mr. Webb Spider. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
he looked at me. I beg your pardon? Well, we shall see. Here he comes now. Cinderella must be home by midnight, or she'll lose her gown, her slippers, her coach, everything. If we could only stop Vazzy. I've got it. The old witch in the forest. That's it. The witch. On with the dance.
more than you, my love, and the coat. Go out and vaccinate your heart. The love bug will bite you if you don't watch out. 
with me, every bite you then sing and shout, you'll go That's what love is all about. The love bug will bite you if you don't watch out. With me, every bite you then sing and shout, you'll go That's what love is all about. The love bug will bite you if you don't watch out. With me, every bite you then sing and shout, you'll go eighty, 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 and the hoity, hoity, ho. That's what love is all about. has just kidnapped the princess. We hope his majesty, the fathead... Who's a fathead? You are. We'll stop eating long enough to rescue our little princess. And now we take you to the Tower of the Black Knight. Take it away. Yes, sir. Here we are, folks, at the scene of the impending battle. What a glorious day for a fight. If only that king of ours would get mad enough to leave his dining table. And while Louis is trying to make up his mind what there is of it, we have a special treat for you. The next voice you will hear is that of the captive princess. Take it away, princess. Deal, 
My daughter, eh? My armor, knave! My armor! like the end for Louis. And me too. Oh, if only we could penetrate that wall. But that would require the power of many horses, protected by a moving fortress capable of great speed. Oh, woe is me. Hey, Louis. Huh?
Begins get dressed. We're going to have company. I ain't gonna do it. I ain't gonna do it. You will? And you like it. All right, I will. But I won't Or like the it. decoy. <laughs> Shut up, you brat. Shite with pile of buttons.
shucks. There's more than a thousand, I betcha. But how can we take it with us? <laughs> how much power they get out of an engine that doesn't look so very big. Yes, about a thousand horsepower. In the four engines together? Oh no, a thousand each. About four thousand or so all told. Well, looks like I'm getting curious at the right time. You seem to know the answers. I'm an engineer, automotive. An automobile engineer? Just the man I need. My name is Alan. Reynolds is mine. I don't want to bore you, but there's some things I'd like to ask you. Well, you won't bore me by talking about engines. You see, I'm a cartoon animation director. You mean you draw cartoon comedies for the movies? That's right. We're doing a cartoon with a bunch of little imps using an automobile to win a war. Everything is swell except we get in trouble whenever we try to show the engine. I'm on my way out to the coast for a vacation, so I ought to forget about engines. This cartoon stuff sounds interesting. I always wondered how they did it. 
Well, maybe we can dicker a bit. How about spending a day or two at the studio? That sounds okay to me. We've got a cutaway engine out there that might help you. Suppose I have it sent over to your place. That's fine. And when you come over to the studio, I'll show you what we've finished. <laughs> I think it's pretty clever the way you fellows combine cartoon figures with something that looks as real as that automobile. We've made tracings from photographs of a real car for those scenes. But when it came to the sequence inside the engine, we began to have troubles. I think the cutaway engine will help you there. It ought to be here by now. Well, let's go and see. These are the animators, the boys who make the original drawings. We want an army of imps making the engine go. Now you show us what they should be doing. Well... Let's have one of the little fellows on each valve. They could be in the special uniform of a mechanized unit. A great idea! Then we can make the imps hats in the shape of valves and then have them jump up and down. The action will make them open and close the chamber with their valve hats. That sounds good. Except this engine that belongs in the car you're showing has overhead valves. Notice that the valves are on top and you have a direct flow of fuel mixture into the combustion chamber. Oh, well, then we'll put the imps up on top. And because the fuel comes directly into the head, that means greater economy. How about having an old miser imp in charge of doling out just the right amount? A stingy looking fellow with whiskers who just hates the idea of waste. That's okay. The valve mechanism is specially designed for quiet operation, just like everything else in this engine. Why not have monitor imps walking around with quiet please signs? Say, so we'll make a cartoonist out of you yet. Oh, here's the way the valve imps will look. Ten or twelve drawings will be filled in between these two just for one complete movement. When they're all drawn, the action of your imps on the valves will be perfectly smooth and natural. Say, when we get to the place where the general calls for more speed, why don't we turn this thing into an airplane engine? Look, the imps go so fast they're just a blur. We fog out the shot and change to an airplane engine. It's a beaut. That gag is older than you are, fellow. Not bad, though. Remember what I was telling you on the plane, Alan? Aeroplanes have valve and head engines, too. Because they want the greatest amount of power, the last possible ounce they can get, and fuel economy at the same time for long-range operation. As a matter of fact, all the engines that hold major speed records are this same valve and head construction. We have enough trouble making these drawings look like an automobile engine without asking for more. Let's get back to this one here. This engine has 90 horsepower for plenty of pep and performance. Why not have one of the imps in charge of the horses? Someone who could really handle them. What would you think of a Roman chariot driver? You're doing fine. We'll make him a big muscular guy with a whip. Okay? And this engine has quite an oiling system. Four distinct types of oiling, in fact, to meet the needs of different operating parts most efficiently and economically. So, some of the imps could be dressed like a crew of oilers with little sprays and cans. Sounds all right to me. What's this space for? That's the water jacket. It runs around all the cylinders to cool them off. With the valves in the head, you have more room for cooling around the cylinders. That's where our Navy comes in. Imps in submarines. Maybe even mermaids. Well, what I want to know is how you get the sounds of the engine and voices to go with your pictures. That's easy. Let me show you. We use a regular actor whose voice fits the personality of the character we've created. In this film, the general of the imp army does most of the talking. Put on more speed. Give it the works. The voice is on film now, on the soundtrack. Put on more speed. Give it the works. We make a note of how much film is taken for every syllable. That is, how many frames or separate pictures. There are 16 frames to every foot of movie film. So if it takes 12 frames to complete a word or a piece of action, the animator knows he has 12 drawings to make. He uses his own lip movements as a guide when he draws a character speaking. 
Animators don't have to be crazy, but it helps. This is how the animators check the motion in their drawings before they're photographed. We have a timing device which gives our musical director his tempo. We photograph the drawings with a moving beater showing on the edge. We check our action and record the music to this tempo. This is the tracing and opaquing department. In here, the drawings that have been checked are traced with ink on transparent celluloid. We call them cells. Then over here, the opaquers fill in between the lines to give the character body and to block out the background. These are the backgrounds over here. Still more drawings. In fact, in a 10-minute animated cartoon, there are 15 to 20,000 separate drawings. Wow. I never realized it took that many. The cells are put together like an assembly line, and they're photographed one by one over the backgrounds. Following the loss of his studio in 1942, Max Fleischer was called to Detroit to head the Jam Handy Animation Department. His name and reputation brought prestige to the company. This is just a sample of what came under his supervision. Yes, there's plenty going on in this little old world of ours. Let's see what's cooking. Here comes a bit of news. A hurricane put the electric power plant out of business at Amesbury, Massachusetts. That put Farmer Woodson's electric milking machine on the blink. He called for help, and Fire Chief George McDougall and his men came a-running. The fire department milked the 50 cows by hand, and that's what I call pulling together, boys. Fax Magazine tells about the most expensive kiss on record. A lady dove sat on a high-tension wire. Her boyfriend sat on another wire. And then they kissed. And whammo! The powerhouse in the town of Phoenix, Arizona, went out of business for half an hour. The doves? Oh, well, maybe they're just as happy. Are you listening, girl? You may know your reading, writing, and arithmetic, but what do you know about this? Sure, it's a man, but is he the right man? Needn't worry about that anymore. The Mundelein College, Chicago, has just begun a new class on how to choose a husband, how to keep him, and how to spend his money, as if you didn't know. Listen. Fellas and girls, here's a little secret. It's just between you and me and the ticker. The war department doped this one out. John, suppose you were here in London. And Jane, suppose you were here in Florida, about 4,000 miles apart. And you want to get hitched.
The Bar Department says you can stay right where you are and get yourselves married in Tulsa, Oklahoma, by mail. And it's simple, too. John writes an I do letter to Oklahoma. Jane does the same. And Oklahoma says, I pronounce you man and wife. The only thing left is the distance between you and Jane. The War Department hasn't any idea what to do about that. But cheer up, kids. We'll have television soon. Taking candy from a baby is supposed to be the height of something or other. But here we have a bunch of kids in Mrs. J.T. Wright's nursery in Dallas, Texas, who were robbed. Yes, robbed. A low-down burglar got away with a box of 200 diapers. Well, anyway, that's one thing they can't pin on the kids. Talking about inventions, here's something, brother. The United States Patent Office has just issued a patent on an overcoat. Not just an ordinary coat, of course. This one is heated by electricity. The warming current of comfort comes from a bunch of batteries which you carry in a suitcase. Hope the inventor provides a little trailer with a fire extinguisher. You know, just in case of a hot seat. Calling all fishermen. Yep, you fellas with your rods and reels. The Wildlife Service at Washington, D.C. is a coming out with a new radar gadget. This doohickey will locate schools of fish, tell you which way they're going, and let you know their exact size. The Army Air Force has published a book on what to do if you happen to fall into the water and meet up with a shark. Under rule one, the trick is to make a quick swing at the shark, slap the water around and holler like, it, like blazes. Now that's supposed to ruin the shark's self-confidence. If that doesn't work, grab the shark's dorsal fin and hang on until he gets tired. If that doesn't work, haul off and give him a swift kick in the nose. A shark can't take it on the snoot. There's nothing to it. Here's a very, very sad piece of news. A gasoline truck pulled up to Walter Sacchieri Station in Detroit. The driver connected the hose and pumped gas into the pipe, but the gasoline gauge set empty. Now let's take a look under the sidewalk. This is the station's gas tank, and this is where the gas went, right into the sewer. 864 gallons of good gas right into, well, let's draw a curtain over this sad episode. Next time you go to New Jersey, in the neighborhood of West Orange, look up a fellow named Coughing Arslanian. He's a Yale graduate. Don't know the exact address, but he lives among the branches of a giant oak tree. His home has a floor and a ceiling, but his wife couldn't get used to no walls. So she left, and our friend is still up a tree. So about your pinup girls, well, fellers, here's a gal and what a gal. Just listen to this. She's a volunteer, 25 years old, worth $7 million, and what a scrapper. She was in the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, got herself badly injured, too. Spent a year getting over that. Then she did her stuff at Normandy on D-Day, and again at Cherbourg. She's got plenty of service ribbons and the Purple Heart. Who is she? The battleship Nevada. What a gal, what a gal. How's your memory? Who said these words? We can, we will, we must. Yes, FDR, you said it.
knows the story, all right. Thousands and thousands of telephones to be made and all kinds of materials needed to make them. Copper, nickel, cotton, gold, silver. And from where? It's a tough job. Hmm, it ain't so tough. That's what you think. Where did you come from? Oh, I've been around. I know an easy way to get materials and make telephones. You and what army? Don't need an army. Just a little imagination. Watch. I went after, didn't I? See? Here's copper, nickel, wax, lead, cotton, and all the others that you need. Well, that certainly does require imagination. But how on earth are you going to make 433 telephone parts from those paper labels? Still skeptical, eh? Okay, mister, help me clear the deck for action, and I'll show you. Silly idea. <laughs> But maybe I'd better humor this little fella. No telling what he'll do next. Now I'll show him. far so good. But your job is only half done. You still haven't got a telephone. Mister, haven't you got any imagination? Must I do it all? Take over, Ringer. It's your move. <laughs> Music, maestro, please.
Nice going, nice going. But, um, what about the cords? The cords? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, the cords. Uh -huh. Hey, Ringer, how about the cords? so tough. Yes, but your way of... your way of doing it won't help us. Imagine making telephones out of paper labels. Why, <laughs> that's movie stuff. You're not fooling, boss. That's the only place it is easy. In the movie. the end, folks. You know Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen, Comet and Cupid and Donner and Blitzen, but do you recall the most famous reindeer of all? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose And if you ever saw it You would even say it glows All of the other reindeer Used to laugh and call him names They never let poor Rudolph Join in any reindeer games Then one foggy Christmas Eve Santa came to say Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? Then how the reindeer loved him, as they shouted out with glee. Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, you'll go down in history. Twas the day before Christmas, and all through the hills the reindeer were playing, enjoying the spills of skating and coasting and climbing the willows, and hopscotch, and leapfrog, protected by pillows. Look, fellas, it's Rudolph. His nose is a sight. It's red as a beet. Twice as big and twice as bright. Looky, looky, I'm Rudolph. Poor Rudolph. Where most reindeer's noses are brownish and tiny, Rudolph's was red, very large, and quite shiny. Rudolph! Go on home, red nose. Your mama's calling you. Come, come, Rudolph. Tonight you hang up your stocking.
while way, way up north on this dark, foggy night, awaiting the time for his Christmas Eve flight, good old Santa. Mmm, this fog will be hard to get through. Santa with gloom, while slowly he groped toward the next reindeer's room. The lamp wasn't burning. The glow came instead from Rudolph's red nose at the head of the bed. And then came the greatest idea in all history. So Rudolph is told of the dark and delay, the fog and the blackness and losing the way. I need you tonight to lead all my deer on the rest of our flight. Dear Mommy and Daddy, I have gone to help Santa. Don't worry, Rudolph, that's me. Hurry, Rudolph, it's very dark here. Rudolph's red nose as a wonderful light, old Santa flew quickly the rest of the night. that before it was day, the very last present was given away. Hear ye, hear ye, a message from Rudolph. Yes, they'd found Rudolph's message. It's all over town. Hear ye, hear ye, Rudolph at the stadium. Come on, come on. Bad deer who used to do nothing but tease him? Well, now they'd do anything only to please him. Rudolph, my boy, they'll envy you now far and near, for no greater honor can come to a deer than riding with Santa and guiding my sleigh. The number one job on the number one day. I hope you'll continue to keep us from grief. I hereby appoint you Commander-in-Chief. <laughs> 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 
and Rudolph just blushed from his head to his toes until his whole fur was as red as his nose. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Then how the reindeer loved him as they shouted out with glee. Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, you'll go down in history. Join hands, circle left. Now circle right and listen to me. LS, LS, MFT. Alamanger corners like swinging on a gauge. A right to your honey with a right to left eight. Grand right and left around you go. Lucky strike means find a back hole. Meet your honey and give her a whirl. All swing around with the little girls. Smoke them, smoke them, then you'll see. LS, LS, MFT. Promenade and don't you fall, promenade around the hall. Lucky strike is first again, first again with tobacco men. Promenade straight down the pike, it's time right now for a lucky strike. Yes, for smoking that you're bound to like, you just can't beat a lucky strike. Gene Dyche replaced Max Fleischer at the end of World War II. His arrival brought about modern advertising design. One of his key films during this period was Wings for Roger Winsock. If you lived in this neighborhood, you'd know all about airplanes. You'd know the exact wingspan of the latest super transonic hyperstrata cruiser. You could identify the XB-303 at 20,000 feet. You'd know all about dihedral angles and cold fronts and wind drifts. And you'd know Mach numbers better than the multiplication tables. And the reason you'd know all this stuff, oh, there's the reason right now. Roger Winsock, the airplane kid, known on Shady Lane as the boy aeronaut, who's always looking up instead of where he's going. His father says he's air-minded but neighbors call him plain crazy. That was Roger Winsock, right on the beat. Hey, there goes the airplane chaser. Must be Roger Winsock. Winsock's a little screwball. Never looks where he's going. In school, Roger studied reading, writing, and aerodynamics. Hey, fellas, look. I just built this new Jato dihedro turboprop. It's got a 15 G pullout. Uh, let's play baseball, Raj. Nothing but airplanes mattered to Roger. He thought about them night and day. But most of all, he loved to hang around the airport and watch the big airplanes take off and land. One day, Roger saw a very special airplane. Yipe! What a sky buster! It's the spirit of the air age. What's it like to fly way up in the sky? Jiminy! Do you really mean it? I wish I could fly. Oh my gosh, wings. I've got wings. Maybe I can fly. I've got wings. I've got wings. Hey, Phyllis, look at me. Wings. Get a load of wing sock. He's got wings. Hey, Rod, let's see you fly with them wings. He talks so much about airplanes, he's beginning to look like one. Into the wind, Rod. Stand clear, man. Oh, oh, like a bird, Winsock. Just like a bird. What a landing, Rod. Yeah, he's got wings, okay, but he can't fly. What good are your wings, Rod? You can't fly with them. Roger's got wings, but he can't fly. Wings, but you can't fly. You can't fly. Can't fly. I 
can't fly. What'll I do? They don't work. Those wings are not for flying, Roger. They're wings for your imagination. The kind of wings that created the air age. They'll show you a new world. Wowee! Every kind of plane in the world. Old ones, new ones, big, and small. And even the Wright brothers' flying machine. Maybe those fellas had wings like mine. Sorta. Okay, Wilbur. Let her go. We we've done it. Yes, Roger. As men learned to fly farther and higher, airplanes became bigger and faster. An Air Force training plane. Jiminy, if I could only fly one of those. Okay, Winsack. This is your day. Take over. Great maneuver, Winsack. Thank you, sir. Observer Winsock reporting. I see something strange. I am going down and have a look at it. It's a fire. It's spreading from Grizzly Bear Ridge, south by west 12 miles. The best way to get in is by the Eagle Beak Fire Break. Fine job, Winsock. We've saved the forest. The job's not done yet, sir. We've got a free forest for you. Survivor, save same. Hello, hey, you windshot bug busters. The old leaf eaters are ruining my crops. Don't worry about a thing, Mr. Haystack. I'll be right over. <laughs> Cloud in the sky. The firm of Flegel, 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 and Winsock is on the brink of ruin. If we're not in San Francisco by five o'clock with a new contract, we'll lose the business. With the company plane, we could fly there in time, but the contract isn't even written. Winsock, it's up to you. Miss Dimple, take a contract. 
Whereas the party of the first part, hereafter referred to as the party of the second part, shall by these presents make known that we agree... It's almost five. They'll never make it. Well, it looks like the Flegel boys lose the business, CB. Not so fast, gentlemen. Here's our new contract. Good for you. Congratulations, Mr. Flegel. Thank you, sir. Winsock's the name. Urgent. Flood water rising. Coal town cut off. Have only enough food to last 24 hours. Send coal, blankets, medical aid, shovels, send them. kitties, clothes for the ladies, shovels for the men, coal and stoves and bathtubs too, medical supplies to make you well, and music for everyone. <laughs> all the wonderful things that planes did. They're real important. Gee, do you think I could get to be a real pilot? Yes, Roger, you could. But there are many other exciting things to do in aviation. You can build airplanes, or you can service them on the ground. You can be an instrument specialist, a radio operator, or a tower operator, a weather forecaster, or an electrician. Maybe you'd like to be an instructor, or an engineer, a photographer, doctor, or a salesman. No matter what you'd like to do, there's a place for you in aviation. But that's not all aviation is doing for us, Roger. The airplane has changed our ideas about the Earth. We used to think that the people in Europe and Asia lived on the other side of the world, the Eastern Hemisphere. But an air age view shows us that they live on the same side of the world, the Northern half. And we used to have to travel east to get to Europe. But the shortest route is actually to the north. And the airplane lets us travel the shortest way. This is the air age world. It shows the important areas of population in one hemisphere, not more than a day away. Our national security can no longer depend on the protection of mountain and ocean barriers. We must be able to defend ourselves in the air, in all directions, to protect our continent from air attack. No capital of the world is more than a few hours away by air. And through air travel, peoples of all countries can learn to know each other better. Every day, more and more of our world neighbors can fly to our country in a few short hours to meet us and see how we live. We can visit their countries too for business or pleasure. And we can do it even on a two-week vacation. All the wonders of the world are within our reach. We can meet new friends, and old ones too, and see how the people of the Earth live, and understand that they are really very much like us. They have jobs to do, they raise families, they like music and good food. And of course, everyone pays taxes just as we do. Their culture can contribute much to our lives, and they can become our friends. And so you see, Roger, the airplane has brought us together. The better we know the people of the world, the greater our hope for world peace. The airplane has changed the world. Aviation is helping to develop and protect our resources, speeding up commerce and travel, bringing progress to remote areas, 
creating new industries and new careers and providing greater national security. Yes, Roger, the air age is bringing all of us closer together and creating a better world for everyone. Gee, I've got to tell everybody about the air age. And just as before, they laughed, but then they listened some more. And finally, they understood. And that's how the airplane has changed our lives. So you see, I'm no different from any of you. We all have wings. This is the Air Age. Dyche was with Jam Handy five years and was called back to New York to revamp Terry Tunes after its purchase by CBS in 1956. He was succeeded by Bob Kennedy, who was then the animation department manager until 1969. and aluminum for our homes. Aluminum for building, for transportation, for communication, for agriculture, and for national defense. What is it that has made aluminum, one of the youngest members in the family of metals, such an outstanding material? The answer lies in its amazing versatility and unusual combination of properties. Its smart, modern appearance in a variety of natural or colored finishes. Its great strength combined with extreme light weight, an outstanding advantage in almost every metal application. Its high electrical conductivity, with aluminum leading all other metals in a pound for pound comparison. Its immunity to all kinds of weather without rust or corrosion. Its superior light and heat reflectivity, for aluminum brilliantly outshines all other uncoated metals. Aluminum excels most other metals in its ability to conduct heat quickly and evenly. most amazing things about this most remarkable metal is its tremendous abundance as a raw material. In America, the richest of these commercial grade aluminum deposits are located in the central region of Arkansas. Although traces of aluminum may be found in almost any soil, only those clays containing 50 or 60 percent aluminum ore and known as bauxite are mined for commercial production. And here, one of the foremost producers of aluminum derives much of its ore for the reduction plants. In order to ensure a constant and uninterrupted supply of this raw material, Reynolds, some years ago, pioneered the development of extensive aluminum ore deposits in Haiti and Jamaica. These deposits, along with mining operations in British Guiana, constitute the world's largest known aluminum ore reserves, representing a vital backlog of strategic material for consumer goods and defense production. On the island of Jamaica alone, 
more than 50,000 acres are owned by Reynolds for the mining of aluminum ore. As the bauxite deposits are mined out, Reynolds resoils and restores the pits to crop, grazing, or forest land for the Jamaican's use. Mining of aluminum ore in Jamaica is primarily a huge earth-moving operation. And for the islanders, the mines have meant new jobs and a sounder economy. After leaving the mines, the aluminum ore travels on a breathtaking journey over six miles of aerial tramway to the sea. Ochos Rios Bay, the bauxite ore is loaded aboard a modern ore carrier for its trip to the mainland, where the next phase of its transformation to metal begins. Among this maze of giant digesters, settlers, and washers, all the skill and ingenuity of modern chemical engineering combine to provide the first step in unlocking aluminum from the earth. The chemical process reaches its climax in these huge tanks, where alumina is precipitated out of the ore in caustic solution. Later, the water content is driven off by baking in giant rotary kilns, resulting in this pure snow-white powder known as alumina. An ever-increasing amount of this alumina is being used in chemical processing in soil conditioners, in abrasives, and many other applications. In order to reduce the alumina to solid aluminum, it is transferred to one of a number of reduction plants and converted to metallic form in giant electrolytic cells. These plants consume electrical power in tremendous quantities, enough to supply the daily needs of one million people. About one-third of the required electricity is generated at Reynolds plants, and the rest is purchased from outside sources. Over 20,000 kilowatt hours of electricity will pass through the cell to produce one ton of aluminum. modern operation, some of the molten aluminum is transferred directly to a customer's adjacent foundry, where it is poured hot into the customer's holding furnace before casting. Back at the Reynolds plant, as the molten metal is cast, aluminum begins to take recognizable shape and form. the pigs are alloyed with small amounts of other metals to give them the right combination of properties. From the alloying furnace, aluminum now marches forth in the shape of ingots, blooms, and billets, each destined for a specific fabricating sequence. Producing 6,000 pound ingots into aluminum sheet requires giant machinery, plus great technical skill and experience.
sheet is ready for shipment to thousands of fabricators who will reshape it into a hundred thousand useful things from washing machines to airplane wings. The fabricating service, as its name implies, is a service to manufacturers providing them with a great variety of blanked, formed and precision finished parts ready for assembly. modern equipment. Many costly but necessary facilities, often beyond the reach of the average fabricator, are made available through this service, including press equipment capable of handling the largest aluminum draws ever made, plus a workforce of skilled specialists with long experience in high-speed precision fabrication. With imagination and daring, the fabricating service tackles the most difficult production assignments, such as this patented tubed sheet, a solid aluminum sheet with self-contained passages for liquid or gas. The tubed sheet is now in common use, as in this refrigeration unit, and has unlimited possibilities in all types of heat transfer applications. Still another contribution of the fabricating service are the all-aluminum truck and body parts assembled for the leading truck and trailer companies. Because aluminum will not rust, these parts will not need painting, and neither will these aluminum gutters and downspouts. Aluminum buildings are easily constructed, requiring a minimum amount of maintenance and upkeep. Self-insulating against both heat and cold, aluminum sheet provides greater protection for every type of outdoor use, from industrial buildings, large and small, to the most modern residents. Lightweight, strength, and the versatility of aluminum make possible higher payloads in all commercial vehicles, from highway trailers to modern smart-looking delivery trucks. Aluminum adds beauty and flexibility of design to lightweight highway homes and ultra-modern buses. In national defense, as in many other fields, aluminum is everywhere. In the air, on the ground, and on the sea, versatile aluminum serves our fighting men. In today's architecture, aluminum has become synonymous with modern design not only in new buildings, but to facelift dingy old exteriors and transform them into colorful new fronts in tune with the times. The use of aluminum is equally effective inside as well as out. From table lamp to acoustical ceiling, aluminum contributes that decorative modern touch to office and home. Because aluminum reflects up to 95% of all radiant heat and effectively stops moisture, it finds extensive use in all types of insulation. These same reflective qualities add extra efficiency to aluminum heating and air conditioning ducts. 
In the field of home appliances, for decorative as well as functional uses, aluminum has no equal. Rust-proof and corrosion resistant, it helps keep cleaning and maintenance at a minimum. Add the advantages of low cost, lightweight, workability, and multicolored beauty, and it's easy to see why more and more aluminum is being designed into every type of modern appliance. And to help manufacturers achieve the highest quality aluminum products, the Reynolds Metals Company maintains a full-time aluminum styling and design section. Aluminum foil, which is merely sheet aluminum rolled extremely thin, is welcomed in the American home in ever-growing quantities as a convenience of a thousand and one practical uses. For even the thinnest aluminum retains all the advantages of this amazing metal. speed up freezing and distributes heat evenly while cooking and whether in the refrigerator in the oven or on the barbecue grill aluminum foil keeps foods from drying out while sealing in all their natural flavor aluminum foil may be produced hard or soft finished bright or dull and cut into strips fine enough to make non-tarnishing aluminum yarn, which adds sparkle, luster, the gleam of glamour to milady's gowns, the fabrics in her home, and the upholstery of the latest automobiles. Versatile aluminum foil, when used for packaging or advertising, may be laminated to paper or cardboard and printed on high-speed presses in as many as seven colors, adding great eye appeal to packages and reader interest to national advertising. Customer after customer is drawn by the bright, shiny colors and the reflective beauty of aluminum foil announcing the product. And aside from beauty, Aluminum foil serves the public in many other ways. On the store shelves all over America, Reynolds foil packaging and labels possess unequal selling and protection magic. It keeps things like tobacco or chewing gum moist and dehydrated soups dry. It preserves the crispness of potato chips and the softness of prunes. It seals flavor in and keeps harmful light rays out. It provides extra convenience in the form of one-way containers, which can be used right in the oven, such as delicious ready-mixed cakes, ready-to-serve frozen pies, and complete dinners, which only need heating and are ready to serve. All made possible with lightweight, heat-conducting aluminum containers. Only foil offers so much beauty and merchandising value.
foil offers such perfect product protection. To pass on the extensive knowledge gained through its long experience in working with foil, Reynolds maintains a full-time staff of packaging design experts. In powdered form, aluminum provides the kick for our 4th of July fireworks and also adds extra power to military and commercial explosives. In this form, another unusual property of aluminum appears. Suspended in a paint vehicle, the powdered particles float to the surface and form a continuous layer of aluminum over the area being covered. This aluminum shield provides protection from weather and reflects light and heat almost as effectively as a solid sheet of aluminum. Another wide use of aluminum pigments is in the unusual metallic effects obtained in today's modern polychromatic finishes. Billets and blooms continues uninterrupted to still another conversion mill. Extrusion is accomplished by slowly squeezing the heated billet under thousands of tons of pressure out through a die opening. of designs and patterns which can be extruded are practically unlimited, restricted only by the skill of the designer and the requirements of the end product. Extruded bridge railings and light standards need no painting or costly repairs. And aluminum is light enough to make possible an oil drilling rig which can travel on the highways and set up ready for drilling in a matter of hours. High strength, lightweight aluminum pipe the perfect answer to many irrigation problems. Many of the shapes in the do-it-yourself rack are extruded sections, from which a tremendous variety of useful items can be assembled with ordinary household tools. Aluminum extrusions, because of their versatility and ease of fabrication, have opened countless new possibilities for light metal application. To help manufacturers take full advantage of aluminum's amazing properties, the Reynolds Engineering Service, along with the styling and design section, provides customers with better and newer ways of using aluminum, thus helping to solve many difficult fabrication problems. Aluminum now reaches the processing stage at the rod and bar mill. Aluminum bars are fed through smaller and smaller roller openings until small enough to be used for forging stock and screw machine products. The smaller aluminum rod is again reduced in dimension and then pulled at high speeds through a series of dies to produce aluminum wire of all sizes.
Some of this wire is used in the production of screens, nails, rivets, and machine bolts. These intricate machines wind still more of it into heavy-duty transmission cable. Aluminum's high electrical conductivity, combined with its light weight, results in longer spans with lower power loss than any other metal. So convincing are the advantages of aluminum cable that it's used in the majority of modern high voltage systems throughout the world. These same advantages serve to reduce weight and lower costs in thousands of applications for low voltage distributing systems and other electrical uses. In the auto industry, other metals are giving way to aluminum. In mechanical units and parts, as new decorative styling features in gold anodized aluminum. With aluminum's light weight, resistance to corrosion, and many color anodizing possibilities, decorative and functional trim of today's cars is being supplied in ever increasing quantities by bright, colorful aluminum. Aluminum window treatments and color anodized wheel covers and grills, interior and exterior trim, these are only a few of the many automobile parts now being designed in aluminum. And in the production of mechanical parts of all kinds, pistons, torque converters, transmission housings, and other mechanical parts, aluminum has become the standard of the industry. Today, aluminum provides us with better and safer transportation in the air, on the seas, and on the land. In transportation, as in every field of industry, aluminum contributes to our continued progress. In the form of pig and ingot, sheet, rod, and extrusion, foil, building products, industrial shapes, and parts for home appliances, aluminum flows in an uninterrupted stream. Aluminum is transformed into a hundred thousand useful things from the most delicate and decorative to the most formidable and functional, like these gleaming highway giants. From convenient kitchen containers to home insulation, refrigerators, and farm buildings, automobile parts, and Reynolds wrap, building materials, and home appliances, outdoor furniture, and magazine advertising, high fashion dresses, and engine components, electrical cable, and packaging material, bridge railings, irrigation pipe, and an endless variety of do-it-yourself material. Only a few of the things in the almost endless procession that makes up aluminum on the march. March of aluminum continues, an ever-growing parade, supplying the thousands of parts which form the products of today and the better products of tomorrow. Some of the sweetest songs in the world are the songs that people sing to the everyday things about them. Undoubtedly, you've heard the one that goes, Can she bake a cherry pie, Billy boy, Billy boy? Can she bake a cherry pie, charming Billy? And the one that goes, Alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, crying cockles and mussels. Alive, alive, oh. But have you ever heard the one that goes? Soup is the secret of good living. Soup is the secret of good living. 
From the wealth of the earth and the wealth of the sea With spice and herbs so savory A favorite food Down through history Soup is the secret of good living Soup is the secret, the secret of good living Food songs are part of the folk heritage of all nations and universal in delight. Everything goes into the kettle. Delicacies ancient and delicacies recent alike. ever cooked a steak over an open fire? Ever watch the sizzle of the juices from the meat lost falling into the flames? You've shared the feelings of the primitives who wanted to save those flavors. What a pity to spend all those drippings on the brightness of blazings and cracklings of the fire. You can save some of the juices by roasting. But you can capture more of them, and really most of them, by cooking the meat or fowl with some water in a kettle. And that's how soup began. Soup was a discovery destined to interest people of all ages. Juices good to the taste and good for the taster. Soup wholesome and healthful, and enjoyed by all. Old songs, old rhymes tell the theme of joyful soup. Sipping soup gave a wholesome feeling. Old Hippocrates, the father of medicine, recommended it to patients old and young. Chefs, old and modern, have taken soup far beyond those early days. The key to the kettle is flavor. Flavor to loosen the appetite, to quicken the enjoyment of all food. So, seasonings were added. Herbs and spices and cereals, then vegetables. Some recipes were secret. Let the kettle smile, says an old recipe of the Greeks, meaning merely to simmer the soup, to let her chuckle. Bean soup and pea soup, two of our favorites today, were also favorites of the Romans. Sometimes served thick enough to cut. A woman who can't make soup should not be allowed to marry. Throughout history, that thought has persisted. In the Middle Ages, the bride prepared a kettle of soup for the wedding feast, but the groom wasn't allowed to taste it until after the vows were spoken. And then it was too late to do anything about it. The song of soup, softly singing and simmering, is a song of good living. When was it served first as a separate course? There's no telling. In all its Elizabethan elegance, England was limited to a spoon and a knife, and usually sat down to a one-piece dinner, 
cooked in one kettle, served on one plate to be eaten at one time. The broth was sopped up separately with slices of bread. The bread so used was called sops. Some men of history tell us that is where the word soup came from. A second course of slices of meat, or the joints themselves, was served in a bowl they called a trencher. Manners were different then. Wide travel broadens our horizons, especially in points of etiquette and styles of food. The Italians gave the English the fork. And the cooking Chinese gave Marco Polo, the Italian man of travel, the noodle. Back in Italy, it became spaghetti, macaroni, and other pasta. In Peru, the Spanish conquistadors discovered the tomato, without which there would be no self-respecting minestrone and no universally loved tomato soup. The potato also came from Peru. Corn from Mexico. Some say Indian squaws first concocted the seafood chowders, famous in New England and gave the chowder recipes to our pilgrim mothers. Others say chowder comes from chow, the Chinese word for food, which crept into our language when Chinese seamen came aboard our Yankee merchant ships to cook. Still others point to the French word chaudière, meaning cauldron or kettle. In many fishing villages, the women folk prepared a community kettle to celebrate the safe return of the fleet. Into it went all manner of catch from the sea. Most agree that the most flavorful, nourishing part of any fish is its broth. The traditional seasonings, of course, and the common onion in the kettle work beautiful miracles. Pepper pot soup came from Philadelphia. There is no doubt <laughs> among food historians about that. Way down yonder in New Orleans, the blues came to birth, and also the wonderful variety of gumbo. The colorful pageantry of food history tantalizes the gourmet. quickening tempo of living today permits all of us to indulge our creative fancies in the arts of cookery. Prepared and semi-prepared, the convenience foods of today can be used as the basis for new and imaginative dishes. Modern convenience foods save precious hours in preparation. The busy homemaker of today is free for the imaginative touches and little luxuries to excite the appetite. Today she cooks creatively without having to start with raw ingredients, without peeling, picking, plucking and scraping her way to the point where the arts come in. She skips by the boredom and gets to the part of cooking that is fun, to the part where she can create by using her individuality and her imagination. Today, every meal can be something festive, with modern convenience foods providing the base ingredients for dishes truly elegant. Even the snack can have culinary impact and glamour, too.
universally love tomato soup, vegetable soup, chicken vegetable, vegetable beef, chicken noodle, beef noodle, chicken rice, cream of chicken, mushroom, and on and on. One of the greatest and most recent discoveries in the history of soup is, of course, condensed soup. The makings of a meal are preserved in a small, bright container, ready for the kettle with only water or milk to be added. Our modern shelves of plenty place a world of unusual blendings of flavors at our fingertips. No people in history ever fared as well as we do. No people on God's green earth ever enjoyed so much of the good things of life and in such enjoyable and nutritious variety. Our modern shopping baskets, swelling with abundance, topple the tall tales and all the romance of food lore from centuries past. Soup sets the appetite singing, for indeed the wealth of the earth and the wealth of the sea make it the perfect companion for hungry humanity. Soup is the secret of good living. Soup is the secret of good living. From the wealth of the earth and the wealth of the sea with spice and herbs so savory, a favorite food down through history. Soup is the secret of good living. Soup is the secret, the secret of good living. <laughs> After 35 years, things changed. The Jam Handy organization was replaced by Campbell Ewald as General Motors Advertising Agency. This loss brought about the demise of Jam Handy starting in 1969. It was reformed as the Bill Sandy Company in 1971 and was later known as the Sandy Corporation. And while Sandy carried on in the tradition, 
it was limited to custom sales training and electronic media for the automotive industry. While more in tune with efficiency in modern times, it could not surpass the accomplishments of its foundational company that truly was the Hollywood of the Motor City.